Hey guys, Bartels Bookshelf here with my final uh, video for the Read What You Own Challenge. Yes, I finally completed my goal of reading 25 books before I bought any new ones. Um, I will admit I did break the rules once or twice uh, uh, after the holidays. Me and Nikia and Laura went on a, a, a book buying spree, but I, I was pretty conservative. I didn't go too crazy, and um, none of the books that I bought um, with my own money... Um, I counted. I didn't count any of them towards the challenge. So, but yeah, I completed the challenge. I'm really proud of myself. I'm feeling really good about it. Um, I'll kind of talk more about uh, sort of my my thoughts on the challenge at the end of the video. But um, I've got six books to get through here. These aren't all in the exact order I read them. Uh, I've just decided to um, go. Uh, I, I'm starting with three of the short short books that I read, and then I read three longer ones, and I'll I'll talk about those in more detail. So. First off, I read um, Quag Keep by Andre Norton. Um, this is a, a fancy novel from 1978. This was actually the first um, licensed D&D novel, um, which takes place in the Greyhawk setting. And uh, as I've mentioned before, when in regards to like the Dritz novels and stuff like that, I, I always enjoy some good sort of classic sword and sorcery fantasy. And I was curious to see kind of where it all started. So yeah, uh, and this is pretty interesting. Um, it's very... Um, cliched but in like a fun way it's about um a guy who uh receives this new war game uh in the mail and uh as soon as he touches the bar the uh the fighter figurine he gets transported into the fighter's body in the world of greyhawk and uh he uh is transported along with a bunch of other people who also were uh transported there mysteriously and all the members of the party have these mysterious uh um, bracelets on their on their arms that uh, that are like a, have a bunch of six sided die or a, have a bunch of dice on them that like uh, roll whenever like something happens and they can like uh, use their willpower to like influence the dice roll and stuff like that and so they decide to go on this adventure together to figure out kind of who started this whole thing who's binding them together and it turns out that um there's a uh, this uh, mysterious uh, sorcerer guy who's um, basically trying to uh, merge the, the, the two worlds of our world and the fantasy world of D&D. &D. So yeah, uh, as you can tell based on that, it's a very cheesy, very cliche concept. It's sort of, you know, isekai, you know, people getting transported to a fantasy world kind of thing, but I love that sort of stuff. I've never read any Andre Norton before, but I know she's kind of considered like a grand mistress of fantasy. She wrote the Witch World series. I have a few of other, her other books, but I, this is my first um, novel by her. Yeah, it's, it's not incredible. A lot of the characters are kind of, you you know, cardboard cutouts, very uh, cliched, very, um, and a lot of the dialogue's kind of samey. There's, it's kind of difficult to like differentiate the characters from one another, and to have such like a big cast. There's like six party members, and this is uh, this isn't even this is barely this is under 200 pages, so it's kind of you, you, there's not really much in the way of like character development or like differentiating the different the characters from each other. Um, but it's still a lot of fun. Um, from what I understand, Andre Norton wrote it after uh, playing an early version of D and D, um, and it definitely reads like someone kind of writing down their campaign and in that sense it's a lot of fun and uh, it's a very diverse group of characters which is something that i enjoyed i mean you've got your typical you know you've got the fighter and the barbarian and stuff but um the barbarian for example he's he's a he's a he's a werebore uh berserker very big and burly and he's got like uh, pronounced uh, canines and stuff he, he, he's a lot of fun um one of the characters named gulf is a, a lizard man and he's really cool he's like kind of mysterious they aren't really sure whether they should trust him or not um but he ends up you know, proving himself and uh, being quite heroic. Uh, they fight a bunch of uh, liches at one point. There's a, a big fight with a dragon. Um, there's a scene where they go to meet this uh, this golden dragon who like helps give them advice on to like where to go. It's just very like classic fantasy, very entertaining. Not high art by any means, but if you like D and D and you're kind of curious to see where it all started. Um, you could do you could do way worse than this. I think it was a lot of fun. It was easy to read. It flowed really well. I definitely like to read more of uh, Andre Norton's stuff uh, in the future. So yeah, that was um, Quag Keep. That was a lot of fun. Enjoyed that. And kind of on a uh, a similar note, uh, I mentioned this in my uh, Christmas sci-fi haul video. This is one of the ones that Aaron got me. 
this is The Skylark of Space by uh, E.E. E. Doc Smith, or Edward E. Smith, as he's credited here. This is uh, considered one of the uh, the first um, space operas. This is originally published in, uh, um, I think it was Ama- Amazing Stories in um, 1928, but it was written from 1915 to 1921, and apparently E.E. E. Smith um, had trouble finding a publisher. And yet, again, uh, similarly to Quag Keep, this is very, obviously, considering its age and being the first of its kind, it's very cliched, but it's a lot of fun. Basically, it's about this scientist named Richard Seaton who um, accidentally develops this mysterious compound that they call X that um, basically allows things to um, essentially kind of uh, just shoot out you know they're they're able to like just fly up into space with no regard for like gravity or anything like that it's kind of similar to um, the compound that was uh, developed in from the earth to the moon I can't remember what that's called I'll put it here but it's kind of similar to that and um, he he ends up uh, working with uh, his good friend uh, Martin Crane M. Reynolds Crane, as he's known, um, who's like this, you know, billionaire philanthropist, super rich, super smart, um, and they work together to develop a a spaceship to take them to space, which they uh, name the Skylark. But there's this uh, evil sort of rival scientist named uh, Mark Duquesne, who uh, ends up... um, trying to uh, sabotage um, their whole operation because he wants the compound for himself so that he can make money off of it. He ends up uh, kidnapping uh, Duquesne's, or he ends up kidnapping uh, Seton's uh, fiance, and uh, they end up flying off into space, and Crane and uh, Seton have to go after them, uh, and, you know, it's just kind of about their adventures. So yeah, this was a really interesting book. It's obviously of its time, but one of the things that I found really interesting about it was that the first half is, is kind of like just an Edison aid, you know, you're the typical, you know, like gifted scientists kind of building these, you know, elaborate machines and stuff. And then once they go into space, it turns into a very uh, typical, prototypical um, space opera novel, you know, with like these two, they run into these two warring alien species. And yeah, it's it's just a lot of fun. Obviously, like it's it's nothing that you haven't heard of before. Um, on like a writing level, it's very it's very much of its time. It's very pulpish. It's very uh, very silly. Um, the science is ridiculous, obviously. But one of the things that surprised me actually was that uh, for its time, um, the, the female characters are actually quite um, strong. Uh, Seton's fiance, in particular, Dorothy Vainman, she gets a lot of moments of like being a badass, where she's like threatening this uh, uh, threatening um, Duquesne's like henchmen with guns and stuff like that, and like talking about kicking his ass and stuff that surprised me and of course as uh, as often the case with a lot of this old pulp stuff it's very homoerotic <laughs> um seton and and duquesne like have like major vibes and like uh, both duquesne and seton um their, their their physiques are constantly being described you know they're both like big strong burly men and there's this one scene where when, when uh, Duquesne kidnaps uh, Dorothy Vainman, and he's wearing this like head to toe like leather outfit you know and it's and it's described it's like it's like super tight and like there's one scene where he's uh the, the the spaceship shoots off into space and he's like fighting gravity to try to like turn off turn off this uh this breakaway switch and it talks about how you know like his muscles are straining and like and you can see them like popping through his his, his leather suit and stuff and yeah, it's just there's just constant like descriptions of like the male physique in this there's another scene where after they arrive at um after they arrive at this planet called Osnome, uh, they end up being uh, welcomed by this like despotic uh, king, and they're given like a, a set of slaves to like follow them around. The women get female slaves, the men get male slaves, and there's a scene where the, the where um Seton goes off and like undresses in front of the slaves, and it talks about how the slaves are like enamored by his his like his broad back and his like impressive physique. It's like it's very homoerotic, <laughs> so that was fun for somebody like me <laughs> it's very silly it's very ridiculous there's like there's like crazy space battles and uh warring alien societies there's you know crown princes and stuff like that it's it, and uh insta love like um uh, one, one of the other women who gets kidnapped is, is, is a lady named um peg spencer margaret peg spencer who's like uh the secretary of um one of the guys who's like arranging this whole kidnapping scheme i can't remember exactly but she she ends up falling in love with uh with um martin crane and it's like it's like they're it's like within like 10 pages like they're already like professing their love to each other and like proclaiming to like get married and they end up getting married on uh, osnome the planet and stuff so it's very silly very much of its time but again similar to quag keep um, if you're able to kind of keep that in mind, if you have a taste for this kind of stuff like I do, if you love this like cheesy pulp space opera stuff, I mean, this is pretty much where that all started. So it's it's wildly entertaining. I thought it was a lot of fun. And it's super short. This copy is only about 
160 pages, so I read it in like a day. Um, in fact, I enjoyed it so much, I went out and I bought the uh, the rest of the books in the series just because like it's it's not high literature by any means. But E. E. Smith, he's got a, he's very he's got a very fast paced sort of you know one two punch writing style. Um, it's just very very ridiculous, very silly. It's a lot of fun. I enjoyed it quite a lot. So yeah, there you go. If you if you're into that kind of thing, there you go. Skylark of space. Um, next on the shorter reads, I read um, After Dark, My Sweet by Jim Thompson. Uh, this was originally published in 1955, I believe. Yeah, 1955, and this was the basis for a film that came out in 1990, directed by James Foley, which I haven't seen, but I've heard is really good. And based on this, yeah, um, I'm sure it is great, because if the movie's faithful to the book, then I'm sure it'll be amazing, because this was great. Um I have a bunch of Jim Thompson that I've collected over the years, but this is the first one I've actually read of his. Of course, I've heard a lot about him. He's like the crime author, one of the, one of the like hard-boiled fiction authors of the of the fifties. And yeah, I can see why this was great. Uh, so this is a very short, uh, powerful novella about this guy named um, William Kid Collins, who was a former boxer who was um, who's escaped uh, a mental institution. Um, he's been kind of in and out of uh, institutions uh, after. Um, uh, after uh, retiring from boxing, after he uh, uh, accidentally killed someone in the ring, and he ends up wandering into this bar where he meets this woman named Faye, and um, they sort of hit it off, and uh, she ends up picking him up, and they go back to her place where they eventually meet um, the third person of this uh, trio of characters, um, Uncle Bud, um, whose real name is Garrett Stoker, but everyone calls him Uncle Bud. Uncle Bud uh, has these has this uh, crazy plan to uh, kidnap um, the young heir to this like big family fortune, so they can hold him hostage and get uh, ransom money out of him. It's basically about how they attempt to execute this plan, and as it often does in these classic noir novels, things quickly... Uh, go wrong. This was great. I really liked this. Jim Thompson has, the, it's very like Chandler-esque, very uh, Dashiell Hammett, you know, very hard-boiled prose, very, you know, like hard-bitten men and and, 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 uh, and tough women. There's just, just this real dirty sense of like uh, life on the fringes, kind of street urchins and and, and sort of uh, small-time criminals and, and con men and it's just very grimy. This is published in 1955, but I mean, aside from a few, you know, little references here and there, like you would never know it. This felt like really modern to me, just with uh, the the depth of characterization um, and and just the, the the sharpness of the dialogue. There's a there's this real sense of like mistrust because you know all all three of these people, neither of them really trust each other, and and as there often is in, in classic noir fiction, there's this kind of uh, sense of um, paranoia and um, double crossing, triple crossing, very intense, very suspenseful. Um, Especially once they actually carry out the the kidnapping plan and uh, and kind of the, the the walls start closing in. Kid Collins was actually really really interesting because he he's portrayed very um, a, a big theme in the book is kind of about um, misjudging people and kind of um, the folly of sort of going off of first impressions because the reason that. Um, Uncle Bud kind of picks up on Kid Collins is that he sees him as like you know kind of a, a dope you know like a a, a a fall guy who's you know not too bright and and based on kind of the exterior that he presents to the world you would think that but because this is narrated from his perspective we're in his head and he's actually quite um, shrewd and very um, observant more so than people would realize in in like another novel he might just be kind of like a dumb sort of lackey or henchman character but in this we get to see things from his perspective and he's not as dumb as people think he is and 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 there's just a lot of that like sort of uh, inner machinations and stuff uh kind of figuring out fig figuring the game out um in terms of the other people who are involved in the scheme and everything and and it has a, a wonderful ending a very tragic ending as a, a lot of these noir novels often do that it's just the classic themes of um you know fate reaching out to trip up the character and uh, sort of ending on this like blackly ironic note i also really liked how they handled um collins's um mental uh mental problems uh it felt very well researched very well thought out he has these moments of like dissociation and like anger problems and uh and there's a lot of stuff in the book about kind of the the loneliness of being sort of a mentally ill person that kind of society has sort of given up on um how you know nobody really trusts you and how you become terrified of like revealing your your history to people just a lot of stuff about the way that society perceives mentally ill people it was really surprisingly um complex and nuanced for a novel from the 50s i really just there was so much good stuff in this book i really and it's so and it's really short it's only about 133 pages but i there was so much packed into here 
and I loved it. I thought it was great, and I really look forward to reading more Jim Thompson soon because this was like a, a total knockout. So, yeah, there you go. After Dark, My Sweet. Highly recommend that. Okay, so now we're going to focus on three uh, longer novels that I read, the first of which is uh, Consider Flavus by Ian M. Banks. This is the uh, the first novel in the Culture series, um, which is this big, famous uh, space opera series um, written from the 80s, from, from 1987, the first one, to 2012, 2013, I believe, when um, the author unfortunately died. A lot of people love this series. Um, Gary K. Wolf talked about it extensively in um, that uh, Great Courses uh, lecture series that I mentioned. Just one of the ones I've always been meaning to get to. And I, I, I know um, these are all standalone, and a lot of people say, like, the reading order doesn't really matter, but I wanted to, I, want, I like reading things in order in the way in, in publication order if I can um, but a lot of people say not to start with this one and I think I can kind of see why um, because to be honest I found this a little bit disappointing but I'll get into that so so the culture is this kind of massive post scarcity society um, that are sort of uh, encroaching themselves or in, you know throughout the galaxy and um, this takes place during a moment during in a, a war between uh, the culture and uh, these uh, three-legged massive aliens called the Adirans and uh, this is from the perspective of a man called uh, Ho uh, Bora Horza Gorbachev, or Horza for short, who is a, a changer, which is basically like a shapeshifter, and he's on the side of the Adirans fighting against the culture uh, because he believes that the culture is like a, a is, is sort of a, a philosophical dead end. He, he feels that they rely too much on on their uh, machines because uh, all, almost everything in the culture is run on these giant uh, artificial intelligences called mines that you know pilot all the ships and everything like that. And he gets sent on this mission by the Adirans to retrieve uh, a culture mind that's been buried um, in this uh, in this planet that he grew up on with a bunch of other changers. So he has to kind of like, it, it's almost like a homecoming for him where he has to go and retrieve this thing. And along the way, he ends up with a motley crew of uh, space pirates and stuff like that and of several other adventures that kind of distract him from uh, his mission. I really, really liked... A lot of this, the, the main thing that I, I just really enjoyed was Banks's imagination is just so expansive. Um, there's so many interesting ideas with, you know, the changers, um, with the culture. There's this whole uh, sequence taking place with this uh, uh, with this crazy, like, card game called Damage, where um, the players have, like, actual lives, um, which are, like, represented by, like, actual people um, that are killed when, you know, when they lose a turn. There's a lot of stuff about, like, you know, sort of post-singularity and artificial intelligence and stuff like that that um there's a lot of great um, set pieces. Uh, Ian Banks writes a lot of amazing set pieces in this book. One of the ones that I really liked, especially, was when um, he goes on this uh, mission to like raid this uh, this derelict ship that's being abandoned because this um, this giant ring sort of planet is about to be destroyed by the culture. And uh, while on there, they the ship ends up crashing into this like uh, airborne sort of iceberg thing. And so it's this really like this like race through the ship as they're like trying to escape. You know, running down as the ship's like slowly crunching into this like giant piece of ice. There's a lot of stuff like that that's like really weird and interesting. There's another set piece that I really liked where um, Horza ends up stranded on this island where he meets this group of uh, sort of, uh, they call themselves the Eaters. And they, they sort of like eat um, all of the non-essential materials like like dirt and and uh, snail shells and stuff uh, to sort of as sort of like a religious like spiritual thing. Uh, and he's uh, almost uh, eaten by the leader of this group, um, who's this like really corpulent fat guy named uh, Fui Song. That was really cool. There's a lot of really interesting stuff going on, but at the end of the day, the thing, it just, it didn't entirely come off for me. There's so much going on, and we're kind of racing from, like, one set piece to the next that there's really no 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 time to really, like, get to know any of the characters. None of the characters really, like, came alive for me, other than, like, Horza, um, because we spend, the, the book is from his perspective, we spend all of the time with him, so you kind of have to, like, develop him at some point, you know? But none of the other, I didn't really care about uh, the, the crew that he ends up running into, um, the space pirate crew. I just didn't really care about any of them, you know, like, I didn't really, none of them were really all that interesting. He meets this girl on the ship that he ends up falling in love with, and I thought their relationship was just really hokey and corny. There's a few, like, interesting characters here and there. One, one of the ones that I really liked was, um, uh, they meet this injured Adiran called uh, Zoxarl that they end up sort of taking with them as they're trying to find this mind. And he was really interesting. He's sort of like a world weary, and uh, I liked him a lot. There's another character named Uneha Klosp, who's like um, he's an artificially intelligent robot who's kind of very snarky and like pissy, like always like always has like a pithy comeback, and he's just like 
<laughs> kind of like a C-3PO if he was like super, super sarcastic. I really liked him. But none of the characters really came alive for me. And as much as I really liked um, Banks' imagination and just all the ideas, I felt like we were racing through all these different set pieces so quickly that there was really no time to to really get a sense of any of it. There's a lot of talk about um, the, the dueling philosophies of the culture and the Adherans, but we don't really learn anything about what the Adherans' philosophy is, other than, you know, they, they believe in, like, conquering space and stuff like that. But but because the whole reason that Horza is allied with them is because he, he, he sees the culture as, like, a philosophical dead end. And uh, and he talks all the time about, like, oh, oh like, I, I, I don't agree with the Adherans' beliefs, but we never really learn what they are. Um, I just felt like there was a lot of missed opportunity to like really take the time to develop the characters in the universe so that towards the end of the book, I just didn't really care that much. I will say the final hundred pages or so were really, really good where all the characters and plot lines kind of come together. And so because of because they're, all the characters are together in one place and we're taking the time to like follow them all, we, we, you get a little more of a sense of like development from them and a little more like personality in that sense. So I really enjoyed that. And this also ended with a really, really interesting postscript that um sort of a recon it's 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 a uh, this fictionalized history of the adiran culture war where it's it's almost like an epilogue where you find out like what happened to everybody and it really kind of um recontextualizes the whole story and the whole like um the whole like meaning of the war and uh, of the events in the book and i really really liked that so i mean generally yeah like very mixed bag for me I really liked the writing. I really liked the ideas. Um, I just don't think it was entirely successful. But as I mentioned earlier, um, I've heard a lot of fans say like not to start with this one. A lot of people prefer the sequel, the player of games and uh, use of weapons, which I do want to read them. In fact, I have... Um I, I just got a uh, player of games from the library, so I do want to continue with this series. I, I did really like it, despite a lot of my reservations, and I want to see where it goes, especially because each novel is basically standalone, like taking place in the same universe, but totally different characters, different storylines. So they're all very different from each other, so I'm sure that um, I will find something to enjoy about this series, but um, to be honest, like this one was a little disappointing. But I didn't. I, I, I did enjoy it. I, it, it, was, it was a good read. I, I'm glad I read it. So yeah, that was uh, Consider Flavus. Next, whew, uh, this was a big one. <laughs> Next, I read uh, The Troop by Nick Cutter. This is a very notorious uh, horror novel that uh, my friend Nakia also read alongside me. And we both loved it, um, but we were both very disgusted by it. <laughs> uh, so this is about a troop of Boy Scouts. I believe it's five kids. They're, they're on this uh, island in the middle of nowhere uh, on, a, on a weekend camping trip with their scoutmaster named Tim. Everything's hunky-dory until this mysterious man shows up who's like starving and hungry and, and, and emaciated. And uh, basically it turns out He's got this uh, hyper-evolved, um, genetically engineered uh, tapeworm inside of him that uh, is uh, endlessly adaptive and gets inside people and basically starves them to death and, and, and eats away at their bodies. Um, and that's kind of the, the whole plot. It's kind of like uh, Lord of the Flies meets like Stephen King. Um, a little bit of uh, The Ruins as well. I really enjoyed this book. Um, I'd heard a lot about it, obviously. like It was, it was very popular. I was kind of worried about it being overhyped, but... Um, yeah, it was great. The thing about it is that it's it's not so much about what he's writing about, it's how it's written. So like a lot of the characters are pretty like stock. You know, you've got like the the shy nerdy character, you've got like the the jock guy, you've got the weirdo like psycho kid. Um a lot a lot of sort of very tropey things. But just the way he writes about things, this is some of the most, like, visceral, like, disgusting body horror I've read in a long time. Um, like, they're, like, legit, like, there were parts in this book that, like, made me, like, physically ill, and that never happens to me when I read books. Like, there's just some really, like, reprehensible, disgusting shit in this, like, involving, you know, body horror, you know, like mutilation, animal cruelty, like, there's just some really fucked up shit in this book. And Nick Cutter, like, writes about it so viscerally and so beautifully. It reminded me a little bit of uh, Clive Barker in the sense how he kind of mixes, like, the, the poetic metaphors and language with this, like, savage violence. Um, Stephen King obviously blurbed the top there, and, and it's there's a, this is a very heavy Stephen King influence with kind of the, the small town tragedy kind of thing, you know, these, you know, ver the, the very kind of a very boyish kind of um, camaraderie from something like It, you know, um, or The Body. Very reminiscent of that kind of stuff. But, um, man, like, this book was just nasty and really tragic, too, because, um, well, as I said, a lot of the characters are kind of stock. 
you spend so much time with them and uh, Nick Cutter takes so much time to develop each character to really like get in their heads um, and what happens to them on this island is just like so horrific that you can't help but like really feel it for feel for these people it was a great book i'm really i'm really happy i finally read it but yeah definitely not for uh those with weak stomachs i mean there's some like really like reprehensible shit in here especially if you have a thing about like animal cruelty th- probably don't read this book like there is some like horrible shit that happens to animals in this book including um cats so you might not like that if that bothers you you might not want to read this but if you can stomach it um I thought it was just a really solid exercise in just disgusting, grotesque, tragic body horror. Um, On the back here it says it was the winner of the uh, inaugural James Herbert Award. And I can definitely see the James Herbert influence. This definitely has has the vibe of something like Rats or The Fog um, with its, like, savage violence and everything. And, yeah, I, I, I was surprised. I liked this way more than I thought I would. So if you like this kind of thing, if you think you can stomach this kind of thing, I highly recommend that. And then finally, speaking of Clive Barker, I have uh, The Damnation Game. This was uh, Clive Barker's first novel, published in 1985. I was chatting with it with a pen pal about sort of a weird, bizarre, complex fantasy stuff. He was asking for recommendations for that kind of thing because he'd recently gotten into China Mieville and uh, Neil Gaiman, and I recommended heavily Clive Barker. And me kind of talking about Clive Barker to him sort of reignited my love for the guy, and I was like, damn, like I want to read some Clive Barker. And I've had a bunch of his books set aside um to read um and, I, and so i finally grabbed uh, the first i decided you know what i'm gonna read them in chronological order so i grabbed the damnation game off the shelves and i read it and yeah it was great <laughs> this is a uh, an interesting thing from clive barker because it's somewhat more um conventional i guess you'd say in terms of like horror stuff it's not really it's not the crazy bizarro fantasy stuff of something like weave world or the great and secret show but it's also not like the the super hardcore um, graphic horror of something like um, Hellbound Heart or Books of Blood. Um, although there is some, there is some pretty horrific stuff in this, but this definitely feels very much of its time in that sense of like that that '80s horror fiction boom, alongside the likes of like Stephen King and Ramsey Campbell and all those sorts of people. But um, what makes this really special is a, a, again just Clive Barker's skill as a writer um, and just the way he describes things and. Um, so I, so it, what ended up being kind of like a very conventional story ended up really sucking me in, and I read this over the course of like three days. And this is a pretty long-ish book. It's over 400 pages. So, But yeah, so this is about um, this guy named Joseph Whitehead, who um, it opens with a prologue uh, in Poland, a World War II strewn, you know, destroyed Poland. This guy, Joseph Whitehead, ends up challenging this mysterious card player named Mamoulian to, uh, to a card game, and uh, uh, we, he ends up winning... And we never really, we don't really find out what happens. Um, and 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 then the uh, the novel jumps ahead to the present day, 1980, 1985, when when it was written. And uh, we follow this guy named Marty Strauss, who's a an ex convict who gets um, an early release um, because he ends up uh, being put in Joseph Whitehead's employ as a kind of bodyguard to protect him from this mysterious uh, entity, Mamoulian, who's uh, he's, he's coming to collect. He's 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 a uh, He's a hellish um, sort of debt collector type guy, and um, he goes to extreme lengths to um, to get to uh, Whitehead, which this book um, very much <laughs> details. So again, I mean, in terms of like the actual plot, it's like fairly conventional. The execution is just what makes it so good, and there's just like so many Barker esque characters and and, ter- and 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 moments in this that I really enjoyed. That are the typical you know the typical Barker hallmarks of you know extreme violence, body horror, um, mutilation disaffected characters drug addicts just in in that in that classic barker way where he's just able to get into the these characters heads and really make you understand them if not sympathize with them and one of the things i really like about barker's fiction is how a lot of the characters are kind of like they they slip and slide all over the place um you know the the characters that you think will are are, are going to be like bad guys turn out to be a little bit deeper than that. The characters who are protagonists end up to end up turning out to be antagonists or kind of something in between. Nobody's really like easy to to get a grip on, and I like that. I like that sort of nuance of how nobody's re- really 
wholly good or bad in Barker's fiction. And there's just a lot of really great stuff in this. Like, um, Mamoulian has the power to, like, bring the dead back to life, and he uses these powers on this guy named uh, Anthony Breer, who calls himself the Razor Eater. He's, like, a child killer slash abuser. Um, a pretty fucking reprehensible, disgusting guy. He's actually resurrected by um, Mamoulian after he tries to hang himself. And at first, you know, you think he's just been, like, resurrected. You know, you, you think all, it's all hunky-dory. Um, but then uh, he starts smelling bad, and flies seem to be, seem to be very attracted to him. And uh, basically, he's, he's, he's a living, rotting corpse, and uh, which Barker describes in his typical... Um, detail <laughs> colorful detail and and just kind of the when it gets into the more kind of surreal aspects of um of mamoulian's powers that's all really really interesting yeah it, it, it was a pretty good book I, I don't think it was my favorite barker because as i said it's it's a little bit too conventional it's a little bit too kind of a lot of the themes we've kind of seen before but what really makes it as i said is clive barker's execution his writing style um his his nuanced characters and the way that he um he kind of keeps you guessing um especially towards the end when shit kind of really hits the fan and stuff gets really crazy. Um, yeah, I don't really know what else to say about it. I mean, it's kind of, I'm kind of all over the place, but I think this was really solid. And uh, yeah, this definitely reignited my love for Barker, and I'm definitely going to read more of his stuff. I'm actually in the middle of uh, the second Books of Blood Omnibus right now, and I'm really enjoying it. And then I'm going to move on to uh, Weave World. So yeah, Clive Barker, Damnation Game, can't go wrong. So yeah, that was my final read for the uh, Read What You Own Challenge. So yeah. 25 books read before I bought anything else. And, um, yeah, I, I have Ollie to thank for encouraging me to get into this challenge. The main thing that I came away with is sort of realizing it was sort of nice to, like, finish a book and then immediately be like, what do I want to read? And then to be able to look around at all the stuff I have and be like, I can pick anything. Like, anything here that I can read, you know, and I can read it. And I, I, I was going through a little bit of a slump toward the end of, of last year, of 2022. And um, this really kind of helped dig me out of it a little bit. Um especially focusing on, like, shorter books, which I, I frequently did throughout the challenge. It just really helped, like, recontextualize things for me, and I really look forward to to continuing the challenge. Obviously, I'm still going to buy books here and there. I don't know. It, it just really... It, I just feel really empowered by it, and it really helped me kind of appreciate what's around me. I don't know if I'm making any sense. I've been recording for 45 minutes, so... <laughs> yeah, uh, just thank you, Ollie. Thank you so much for starting this challenge, for for inspiring me to, to take this challenge on my own. Um, I definitely do plan to read much more of what I own, and um, I think from here on out, I'm just going to kind of do what I said before, where I'm just going to do maybe weekly wrap-ups, bi-weekly wrap-ups, just, or I'm just going to do updates whenever I read enough books that I feel like I have enough to say about. But yeah, um, I look forward to... Uh, going on reading much many more books uh with alongside you guys and yeah have you guys read any of these books let me know what you think uh if you like the video let me know like comment and subscribe and all that stuff uh and until then i'll see you guys next time bye